Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar hosted by the NIH funded MD2K Center based at the University of Memphis. Uh, my name is Vivek Shetty and I'm the training core director for the MD2K's training program. Today's webinar on variable platforms for mHealth research is led by Professor David Kortz of Dartmouth College. Uh, he's one of the early movers in the space of mHealth and among others leads the efforts of the Amulet group that has been developing sensors, apps, and algorithms for sensing stress in naturalistic settings. Uh, professor Kortz is a, a champion international professor in the Department of CS with multiple appointments that include serving as a interim provost, as associate dean of the faculty for the sciences, as the executive director of the Institute for Security Technology Studies, and also has served on the U.S. Healthcare IT Policy Committee. His primary research interests include security and privacy, Purpose you computing for healthcare and wireless uh, networks. Uh, it truly has been very prodigious, publishing over 200 refereed papers, obtaining over $67 million in grant funding, and mentored nearly 100 research students. He's a fellow of the IEEE and a distinguished member of the ACM. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. A recorded version of this webinar will be made available on the MD2K's mHealth Hub. Uh, please, please make sure that you are on mute. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please uh, type them into the question box in your Blue Jeans control panel. Uh, we will have time for questions uh, at the end. Having said that, uh, let me turn over the microphone to Professor Kortz. David? Thank you, Vivek. It's great to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to the MD2K community. I was uh, pleased to attend the MD2K kickoff and have been an eager follower of its uh, many research activities since then. And today I'm, I'm going to talk about two of the projects that we have underway here at Dartmouth with our collaborators at Clemson. One is called Amulet and the other is called Oracle, both of which are wearable platforms that we've developed from scratch custom hardware, custom housing, uh, mechanical design, operating systems, software support systems and development systems and applications, and fielded them in free living conditions. And so as a result, that's a lot. And you'll see I'll be kind of skimming across a lot of the high points. And of course, if you're interested in the details, maybe we can do some of that in Q&A and um, I've cited all the relevant papers as we go through and you'll see on this slide and on the last slide again the websites for the two projects where you can find more information so before I kick into those projects so let me talk about what I mean by M health uh, because that's one of those words that's tossed around and therefore kind of means everything and therefore kind of means nothing uh, but this is what I mean by it it's the use of mobile computing and communications technology in the delivery of healthcare or in the collection of health information, for example, for research or for public health purposes. That's still a pretty broad definition, um, but it's uh, workable. And you can imagine and have seen, no doubt, lots of mHealth devices out there or mHealth applications. There's more announced every day, and they cover the gamut nowadays of different health conditions or research goals. It's not all wearables and it's not all personal devices. So this slide gives you a sense of the reminder that some of the devices like a bathroom scale are an important mHealth device, but not wearable. And another one like a temperature sensor that is somehow um, you know, Wi-Fi connected and feeding information into your health database provides important information about your environment, the health environment that isn't necessarily a health device itself. And not all devices are personal. You might share them with other people in the household or in a clinical setting. And so we have to keep that in mind when we think about security and privacy. But um, I'm going to dive right now into the Amulet project, 
which was inspired by the idea that wrist-worn devices might be a great place for doing health monitoring, which at this point, of course, is uh, well known and kind of a no-brainer. What we've been noticing, though, is that there are sort of two classes of devices. On the left side here, I have wristbands. These are generally single-purpose devices, generally fitness tracking, step counting, very basic uh, purpose, very narrow focus, completely closed platform. And on the right side are smartwatches, which tend to be more flexible. You can develop apps for them and so forth, but they have a very short battery lifetime. In fact, my watch is lucky to get through the day. And so we're interested in somehow something in the middle there, um, a platform that is open that where we can write new apps for it, or maybe even for research purposes, rewrite the system software, and that would have long battery life, that like weeks, so that you could use it in critical ML applications where the loss of a battery is not, um, not as likely to happen. So Amulet was sort of setting out to accomplish some of those goals. The name was inspired by the, the word, which, in, which I think is nice. It gives you a sense of safety in a dangerous world. And this is a big picture view of what we think of as amulet. Down in the lower left is a typical patient, let's say, who is wearing an amulet on his wrist, and he also has some other wearable devices on his body that are feeding data to the amulet, or perhaps obtaining commands from the amulet, uh, which is sort of a body area hub of activity focused on health. When the companion smartphone is available, and I know I don't always have my smartphone available, though I think my teenage daughter does, um, when that smartphone is available, then the amulet has the opportunity to upload data into the cloud or to download maybe updated firmware or new applications. And we envision the, the idea of a, of a prescription model of applications. This person's doctor might assign a certain prescription application to help him manage his diabetes, for example. So when we set out to design Amulet, we had a particular set of goals in mind. We wanted a platform that could run multiple applications, unlike most wristbands, but more like a smartwatch, but that had very strong security to protect apps from each other and protect the system from malicious apps. But like a, a fitness band would have a long battery lifetime and good developer tools to help developers optimize energy to attain that lifetime. And of course, very easy to use because we imagined using this in populations, for example, of older adults who might have more challenges in using a complicated piece of technology. And we wanted to make it open source, which we've done. So this is what Amulet looks like today. It's a custom 3D printed, 3D printed case around our own custom hardware. And if we dig inside that a little bit, uh, you can see that, um, well, let me highlight the, the, the detail, the gist of it here. It's got a bunch of sensors like a gyroscope, an accelerometer, an ambient light sensor, a UV light sensor, temperature, sound, and battery sensing. It has two microcontrollers, an M0 and an MSP430. It has a micro SD, so you can store a two gigabyte SD card for logging health data. It has a BLE radio. It has an LCD, very, very low power display two little LEDs for blinking lights, and a haptic buzzer, so you can uh, get the attention of the wearer, two buttons for input, and a little slider for input, for example, choosing from a menu, and a 110 milliamp hour battery, which, as you'll see, lasts a pretty long time. So once uh, we built that platform, or really while we were building that platform, we also experienced, uh, explored various uh, applications. Most of our work has been on stress monitoring, and I'll come back to that. But we also build applications that could measure heart rate by subscribing to an external Bluetooth chest band sensor. Uh, activity monitoring, step counting and that sort of thing, or inferring the type of activity from accelerometry. An intervention app that tried to encourage more activity. You know, yay, way to go, you're 50% to your step count goal, that kind of thing. Um, a sensor that connects to a TheraBand exercise band. I'll show you more about that. A fall detector, a sun exposure tracker, and also EMA. Ecological momentary assessment is common in research studies, and this allows subjects to enter their EMA responses right on the amulet. So inside the amulet, I, I showed you the custom hardware. On top of that runs a custom operating system we call Emulate OS, and that looks roughly like this. There's a board support layer that deals with the nitty gritty of the hardware, and there's some core services like logging and networking and power management. On top of that is an API that allows applications to 
uh, use the system. And it's an event-driven model for applications, meaning that you design your application as a set of states and transitions between states. That transitions might happen, for example, on the arrival of a new data point from a sensor or the press of a button. And so that makes it very efficient, very compact way of um, expressing applications. Of course, some of these applications might be buggy or malicious, and so we need to protect the system and the other applications from such. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about how we would develop a secure platform. And that means that we need a combination of compile time and runtime security support in this diagram you can see the multi-stage pipeline that takes application code on the upper right and compiles it and analyzes it to detect potential security problems or prevent them when it actually gets compiled and then compiles and links it with the operating system to produce a firmware image that eventually goes on to the amulet. Now looking a little more closely at the security aspects here that analyzer step um, is very important because these microcontrollers aren't like a full-blown microprocessor. They don't have much, in, almost zero, support for security. And so we can't just depend on the traditional operating system approach to protect processes from each other. And so we use C compiler techniques to watch out for potential memory violations in particular and either flag them you know, as an error or uh, wrap them in a way that protects memory at runtime. Initially, we did all of the security at compile time like that. But then we looked more deeply into the MSP430, and it turns out that the newer versions have a memory protection unit, which is a very primitive uh, type of hardware support for securing memory. And it wasn't quite powerful enough to do what we need, but we found some tricky ways to make it work. And so now we have a combination of hardware, software, memory protection that's more efficient. And there's a paper about that. But one of the things that was really important was battery life, right? We wanted to make it possible for this to last for days, weeks, or in some cases, even months. And in order to do that, the developers need to understand the implications of their application design. So this diagram is a uh, automatically produced map of the events and states and transitions in a typical application. And it would be presented to the developer of that application to say, this is how much energy is used on each of these transitions. And so if you can tune with the sliders on the right, how often these transitions happen, either because it's a regular thing, like you sample once every second, or because you anticipate how often something might happen, then we can forecast how much energy this app will use. Or actually, you can make, put together a mix of applications, and it'll forecast for the whole mix. And that um, analysis is done, like I said, automatically using a profile, an energy profile of the device, the application source code, and a set of models that we developed that forecast the energy usage of either an application or a mix of applications. And then we um, tested that on a variety of applications that we built. So here are some of the ones I mentioned earlier, a simple clock application, a heart rate measurement, temperature, uh, ambient temperature monitoring, pedometer, sunlight, EMA, and some others in this plot. And so this plot shows the amount of power used and also in effect, the number of days that the amulet would last if it were running that app or combination of apps. You can see it's quite long. And what's really cool, which I thought was very exciting, was that our ability to predict those lifetimes or the power consumption was remarkably accurate. We were able to predict 90 to 98% accurately how much power a given app or combination of apps would use, and then that would help developers forecast lifetimes and adjust their apps if needed. So we were able to then use Amulet for various kinds of research projects. As I mentioned, most of it stress detection. Um, but also we have a collaborator who is a geriatrician who is very actively in, engaged in doing research on physical activity of older adults and encouraging them to remain physically active. active. And so we've developed apps around that done some EMA studies. We focused a lot on the usability and human factors of the design of Amulet and its apps. And as I mentioned, of course, a lot on security as well. Let me go into just a couple of those. 
So we've done four different studies involving the amulet and stress measurement. Um, this was all inspired by our colleagues at the Center for Technology and Behavioral Health who say, who have helped me understand that stress is a very important factor in a lot of different uh, conditions and activities, in particular addictive behavior can be triggered by stress. But the, there is no clean and simple way to measure stress, especially in the field. And so anyway, we set out to do this with a chest strap heart rate monitor, uh, off the shelf one from Polar, that is feeding heart rate information through Bluetooth to the amulet. The amulet is also used to collect EMA self reports. And in some of this, um, some of our studies, we've added an EDA or GSR sensor as well. And the, this study um, found that with uh, 26 participants, we were able to predict stress, that is to say, infer the level of stress of a, of a subject with an F1 score of 0.81, just using the heart rate sensor. And we actually are now doing another study adding this EDA, and we think we might be able to improve it. This is the EDA sensor. EDA stands for electrodermal activity. Uh, sometimes also known as galvanic skin response. This is another custom device that we've built. In this case, uh, this custom board is, is packaged inside of a Fitbit wristband. Um, it was, the board was designed to snugly fit in, the, in there, and um, you can see the electrodes uh, clipped into the wristband as well. And this one um, is, at the moment, not Bluetooth compatible, but it can run for several days and record data continuously throughout um, those, that time. As I mentioned, our collaborator was interested in work with older adults, and one of the goals is to help older adults, particularly obese older adults, maintain their physical fitness so they can maintain their activities of daily living. And one type of activity that they do to, to maintain strength is to exercise with uh, TheraBand or similar resistance bands. Um, but what he wanted to know, especially when they were doing these at home, was are they doing the, the exercises correctly? How many reps do they do? How hard do they pull, et cetera? And so we built a custom handle or an insert for a handle that measures the force of the pull, um, force you know, that the band is pushing, pulling on the handle. And then that has Bluetooth and it can transmit the data to the amulet in real time. And the idea is that then we could provide the subject's feedback and we could provide data to the clinical support team that is working with that patient. This is what the overall kit looks like. Here you can see the two handles and in one handle the force pressure sensor, a BLE Nano that fits into a case that attaches to that sensor and then through Bluetooth to the amulet. So in the same population we were interested in tracking how physically active the subjects are we developed two applications, one called ActivityWare and one called GeriActive. The ActivityWare app is measuring individuals' daily activity levels categorized into either sedentary, moderate, or vigorous. In other words, how much of your day do you spend sedentary, how much in moderate activity, and how much in vigorous activity, and present that to them on the display and also feed it back ultimately to the research team or a clinical team. And using some controlled tests, we were able to confirm that our Algorithms were about 98% accurate, and then in the field, we can we um, sent the subjects, young and old subjects, into the field to use this application. GeriActive focused that on an older adults um, population, which tend to be less vigorous when they are active. And again, we tuned this uh, to an accuracy of 94%. And in small study, n equals five, older adults seem to like it. We need to do more detailed studies on that. As I mentioned, the uh, human factors were really important. As you can imagine, for any device like this to be successful, we would need to address all kinds of issues. And here's a list of 20 human-centered design principles that one might or may need to focus on. And in this study or set of studies, our part of our team was trying to understand how important these different factors are to potential users and also to what extent are they concerned about privacy. And um, the, uh, this is just, in my opinion, just the beginning of understanding some of these complicated issues, and uh, there's lots more work to be done. 
one of the things that I anticipate would be helpful with such data would be for individuals who are wearing devices like this, mHealth devices, to share it, right? They might want to share it with their doctor or they might want to share it with their caregiver, a spouse or an adult child, or with, um, you know, an athlete might want to share it with her athletic trainer, or in some cases, employees want to share it with their employer to obtain wellness benefits, et cetera. There's all kinds of examples where mHealth data should be shared, but the key is to allow the individual to decide who gets to see what. And so our system called ShareHealth imagines that all the mHealth data coming out of all your mHealth devices come up through your phone into some cloud-based data storage system. And then you can, you can selectively share different slices of the data with various consumers. In this picture, maybe a clinical team or a hospital database. And the key here is that we don't want to even trust the data store cloud. So all the data is encrypted in a way that neither the cloud nor anyone accessing the cloud can decrypt it or even know what kind of data it is unless the owner has given them special hash chain seeds and keys that allow them to find and download the data that has been shared with them. That was an undergraduate project, really, really fun work. I think the other potential for Amulet is in education. Uh, it's open source, open hardware. You can fabricate your own, download all the software, et cetera. And so I can imagine this being um, used in several different ways. For example, a course on wearable computing, right? You could use them as a platform for developing simple applications. Or in, in a more focused engineering-oriented course, you could have an embedded systems course that could measure power consumption or optimize different parameters of the operating system or maybe even the boards themselves, like in a digital electronics course. You could use this in a cross-disciplinary course where engineering students are working with, let's say, health, public health students or something like that to develop some applications or interventions. And then, of course, uh, finally, a student, students in a design course um, might find better designs. Honestly, ours is certainly not perfect and not as beautiful as it could be. Um, and we've been criticized by subjects uh, for its ugliness. And so I'm sure it could be improved. Anyway, so there's a lot of possibility there. It's all open source, and so hopefully uh, others will pick it up and maybe make use of it. So to summarize the Amulet part of this talk, Amulet is a secure multi-application platform, open hardware, open software, great battery lifetime, depending on the apps, of course. Could be days, could be weeks, for a clock or um, something like that, months. And we have an energy prediction tool and other software development tools that help predict battery lifetime. We have found it in our work to be reasonably usable, both by the users, like subjects in a study, researchers and developers, and it has a lot of potential, I think, for other projects. There it is again, amuletproject.org. You can find more papers um, and information and the download link. In fact, here's the GitHub page uh, where you can download all that, all that stuff. Amulet has been running as a project since 2012, and so um, the first ideas and early paper was written in 2011, so it's been running a long time. There's been a lot of people involved. Here's the names of most of them and a photo of the team as of last summer. So now let's switch to Oracle. And so this is another wearable device, very different. It's not a general platform. It's focused on a specific goal. The goal is to measure eating behavior. So this was motivated by conversations with researchers who say, you know, we have all these devices and apps track calorie output, like how many calories did I burn today? How many steps did I do today, et cetera? But almost nothing to track input. There's certainly nothing automatic. So how much am I eating today? Or what am I eating? Or how many calories are I eating? Or at least just let's start with, am I eating? <laughs> and if we can measure when you're eating, we might be able to build on that to answer some of those other questions. So our goal is to develop a wearable device, specifically something you can wear on your ear, like an like a ear, hearing aid who can de that can detect when you eat and how long you eat throughout the day in free living conditions. So this begs the question then, what is eating? And you'd be surprised how difficult it is to answer that question. Um, I've read tons of papers in the literature and cannot find a single consistent definition of what is eating. <laughs> so we define it this way. It's an activity involving the chewing of food 
that is eventually swallowed. Now we could debate this definition because it's not perfect, but it excludes drinking, for example, and it excludes chewing gum. People always ask me about that. Are you eating gum when you chew gum or not? Well, that's debatable. Anyway, um, that's how we define it. And then probably more interestingly for researchers, what is an eating episode? So we might be able to tell you on an instantaneous basis whether you're eating or not eating throughout a day. But most researchers don't care about that on a millisecond by millisecond basis, are you eating? What they really want to know is when did you have meals or snacks, right? And so we define an eating episode as some period of time during which you're involved in an eating activity. Now what does that really mean? If you think about your sitting down to eat lunch, you're not literally eating every millisecond throughout that time. You'd pause sometimes to take a breath, <laughs> or to talk, or to take a drink, or just to read. And so we call an eating episode a period of time when there are no long gaps between eating windows. A window might be one or two minutes, uh, sorry, one or two seconds of eating activity. But if there's less than 15 minute gap between those, we call that part of the same episode. If there's more than 15 minute gap between two windows that involve eating, then we say, oh, that's a separate episode. And the 15 minutes is somewhat arbitrary, but we did draw it from at least one study in the literature. Again, this is a start and the community needs to somehow come up with a better, more consistent um, application of these ideas. So how do you do this? How do you actually automatically detect eating in an unobtrusive way? Now this slide is not a great place for me to say unobtrusive, but these are early prototypes. In the upper left was our first one. We just took a, a sweatband and we sewed into it some pockets in which we could put our microphone and our electronics. Um, and all of these are ways of holding a contact microphone against the skull, against the head. And the microphone then of course picks up sound um, and we're hoping to measure or, or detect the sound of chewing. And so we've built a sweatband and then also in the other pictures, a 3D printed plastic frame that can hold the microphone and the electronics and the battery and deal with issues like people who wear glasses. Um, Contact microphone is a little different than what you maybe are used to. A microphone, the ones you think about all the time, the one I'm using to give this talk, are air microphones. They record vibrations of air that are caused by sound, and a contact microphone actually doesn't pick up sound from the air. It only picks up sound from physical objects in which it is in contact. And so it's used, for example, for a guitar or for certain throat mounted microphones that are designed to be used in very noisy ambient places but where you want to pick up the speaker's voice. And so this off the shelf device and we just uh, put it on the mastoid tip, which is that bone you can feel right behind your ear. And we were focused on this location because we thought that might be a, a great place to hear the sound of chewing, and B, out of sight, if we could eventually make it small enough like a hearing aid. So this is what our system looks like. Um, it has, um, um, in the upper right, in the inner box, is a microcontroller unit that is receiving from other electronics on the PCB, the printed circuit board, uh, the raw analog signals, so the AFE is the analog front end that's doing some signal processing before it's passed into the microcontroller. And then outside of all that, of course, is the mechanical housing that holds the contact mic and the battery as well. In the lower right, you'll see the PC board, PCB board. Actually, I think this one may be one generation older than the current one. Um, but you can see also on there, there's an SD card slot. So one, a lot of what we are doing is to um, put an SD card in there and record the raw data directly to the card instead of trying to process it immediately on board or instead of transmitting it through Bluetooth. Partly that's because Bluetooth is actually very expensive in terms of energy and very limited in terms of bandwidth. And so we can s capture and store more data than we could possibly send through Bluetooth. Eventually, um, we plan to eliminate that and actually focus on onboard processing of the data and sending relatively summarized data over Bluetooth to a smartphone or a smartwatch. Um, then let's test it, okay? So our goal was to do this in free living conditions. Our earliest tests, of course, were in the lab. 
where you can just strap this thing on someone and um, have them eat and do other things so you can train your models. But what the real rubber hits the road when you send them out into free living conditions. But then the question is, what's the ground truth, right? If you want to find out whether your algorithms and sensors are actually detecting eating correctly, you need to know exactly when they were eating on a one second resolution. But unless you follow them around with a stopwatch and a video camera or something like that, it's going to be very difficult to get that ground truth. So we built a second device, which normally would not be used as part of the Oracle, don't get this confused, that is a camera built into a baseball cap, and the camera is pointed down at the mouth, and you can see in the lower right some um, stills from the video that we recorded with this camera. We physically disabled the microphone so we weren't capturing any speech or private information like that. And they were able to take the cap off as self-contained if they were in a situation where they felt the camera would be intrusive to their privacy. But the, we record, this camera has the re ability to record two hours of video, that's all. And so our vi field time was only two hours. We got 14 people, we got a total of 20 hours of data. We sent it off to a, Chinese company that does video annotation had three independent annotators watch each video and painstakingly mark um, at a one second resolution whether the person was eating or not eating according to the video. Then we majority vote those to come up with a quote ground truth of the person's eating history. Time synchronize it with the results of our Oracle's um, sensing and then compare, right? How often did Oracle agree with the so-called ground truth. So let's, before we get uh, to the answer, how do you measure correctness, right? So the traditional way to do this is with um, leave one person out cross validation. So you train a machine learning model to recognize eating using um, <clears throat> n minus one subjects data, and then you test it on the one subject that's left so that you can not contaminate your training data with uh, the data you're going to test later. And then of course you can use different metrics um, for summarizing the results. Accuracy is a simple but crude metric. Uh, precision recall, very traditional. Uh, you could weight the accuracy in some way. We focused, we did all these things, but we focused on the F1 score, which is a, a combination of precision and recall. And that's for the window-based evaluation. So in other words, on a, on a one-second window basis, were we correct or not in saying they were eating or not? And then we, since we're really probably more interested in episodes, we need some other way to measure. Um, did we find all the episodes? And were the episodes we found correct? Did they begin at the right time or end at the right time? And because, of course, episodes have different durations, you can't use a simple precision and recall. So we use Jacquard's and Ward's metrics. The data analysis pipeline is actually fairly um, elaborate. I'm not going to go through all the details here, but the gist of it is first we clipped all the sound to 220 to 250 hertz. Uh, we only sampled at 500 hertz. And the reason was that our early experiments showed that we could detect the sounds of eating with a fairly low frequency signal. This is good news for efficiency. Obviously, we only need to sample at 500 hertz, but also good news for privacy because most voice is well above that. And so actually from this low frequency signal, we can't reconstruct your speech if in fact we captured some speech. We use this uh, three second uh, time windows for most of our processing and we pass it through this, this complicated pipeline here which I won't go into detail. We looked at, uh, of course, uh, all kinds of features. So the first thing you do with a window of sound data is to compute some features across that window. And they're using TSFresh, more than 700 features possible. We use some algorithms to so down select that to the ones that seem to be the most useful. And we ended up with the set here uh, shown in the red box. So. There's 29 features for FFT coefficients, so frequency-based um, features were most were, were very helpful. And then these other one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different kinds of features were also found to be useful. So then we um, 
the the classifier once we've chosen the features and we train models we actually can run the classifier so given a sample a window we want to say is it eating or not eating we actually did it in two stages in part because we we wanted to put this on the oracle and maintain very high efficiency most of the time someone who is wearing a device like this will be silent and it's not worth a whole lot of effort to compute features and do all kinds of complicated classification if they're just silent. So we have a simple threshold detector essentially that says whether they're silent or not and most of this, the windows then are just thrown out as silence. Those that are seem to be not silence are then passed into the classifier and that has a binary output eating or not eating. We actually tried a bunch of different classifiers you can see in the table below and we found the logistic regression classifier to be the most um, accurate and that's where we see the accuracy of 93% and F1 score of looks like 78%. So that's um, a window based classification. But now we want to take each of those uh, um, windows and, and consider them for a possible part of an episode. So in this first stage, we take these three second time windows and we aggregate them into one minute time windows. So in other words, you consider the, the set of 20 three second windows that are in a minute count them all up and if more than 10 percent of them are labeled as eating then we say that minute was eating and if less than 10 percent were not labeled eating sorry if less than 10 percent were labeled eating then we'd say it's not a eating minute and that's what you see on the left side here so then once we have all these minutes or minute by minute are you eating or not eating then we try to aggregate them into episodes using that rule i described earlier if there's a gap and between two eating minutes and that gap is less than 15 minutes, we coalesce all those eatings into one episode. And any gap that's more than 15 minutes will separate two episodes. So let's now look at some performance numbers. We saw a peak at that earlier. Uh, this is again looking just at the window based, the one minute window based accuracy. And we see the F1 score is about 78%. And this is using the top 40 features, which I think is that same list that I showed you earlier. But on the graph in the right, you can see we experiment with different numbers of features. The 40 was chosen because you can see that there's sort of a, a leveling off at that point. If you use fewer and fewer features, then your various summary metrics, accuracy and F1 score go down. Um, and the goal here is to trade off between efficiency, a small number of features is faster to calculate, and accuracy. Um, so 40 seemed like a good balance. Now let's step back and look at the episode-based classification. And now we want to know how often did we correctly detect eating episodes? That's what CD stands for. How often did we falsely detect eating episodes? In other words, you detected an episode that wasn't actually an eating episode. And then MD is missed detection. So that's an episode that actually happened that you missed, that you didn't actually detect as eating. Using the Jacquard similarity coefficient to compare our estimate of the eating episodes with the ones that were actually there, we were able to detect 20 out of 26 episodes. But we also imagined 12 episodes that didn't really exist. Most of those really short. Um, perhaps a better set of metrics are known as Ward's metrics, um, and they're a little more sophisticated than the Jacquard. But the that one, uh, under those metrics, we correctly detected 24 of this 26 episodes, and uh, missed two, and falsely guessed 12. Surely there's more we could do to improve our algorithms. Um, and improve our ability to measure and define, or sorry, detect episodes of eating. Let's also look at efficiency because one of the goals, the, the sort of specification, if you will, is that this thing should be running continuously throughout a waking day. So we really want it to last 18 hours. You come home, you take it off, you charge it while you're sleeping kind of thing. And so we measured the, the power consumption of each component in the system to get a sense of what's the most expensive parts. And then also in different modes of operation, um, the realistic mode is what we call it, is actually not storing the data on the SD card and not sending all the data across the BLE. It's just sending summaries across the, the Bluetooth to the smartphone. 
and um, with that kind of a, a setting, we figure it will last 28 hours, which is more than enough. Is a smaller battery, perhaps. So there's a lot more to be done here. We could handle those misclassifications. We could do a better job of classifying. We might be able to improve it by developing personalized models. Those models were generic. We trained them across a bunch of people and applied the same model to everybody. But people eat differently. So maybe if we could personalize each uh, model, we might get better classification. We might add other sensing. Right now we're focused only on the microphone. We have tried EMG in the past, and you could look at accelerometry, for example, to remove motion artifacts. There are other possibilities there. We've only done tests for two hours, and it would be great if we can test for a full day. Um, we'd like to move beyond detection toward intervention, working with some collaborators who, in eating behavior who might want to explore different ways to intervene in people's eating behavior. We really need to improve the mechanical design. We've had many, many iterations, and it's still clunky and sometimes uncomfortable, and um, it's challenging. We also want to add input, human input, to these devices. Uh, we're really interested in the possibility that you could actually play a sound to them through a speaker, yet to be added, that says, are you eating? <laughs> and Or what are you eating? Or how much are you eating? Or something like that. And then the person could actually provide a response by tapping or swiping or waving their hands or something that is picked up by the oracle. We have a HCI group as part of our group who is very interested in how do you provide input to head-mounted de devices. It would be nice to detect more than eating, like how much are you eating, how fast are you eating, or other things besides eating, speaking, coughing, smoking, um, that sort of thing. So to conclude, Oracle, uh, we built a wearable eating detection device that you can actually wear out in the field and we get a pretty good accuracy or F1 score. And we were able to detect eating episodes, depending on the metrics, 20 or 24 of the episodes out of 26, again, in free living conditions. And we estimate that it has more than enough battery life with the current design to last for a day or two, uh, which is good, good enough, I think, for most studies. And this is the Oracle team as of last summer. Um, lots of students and uh, postdocs and staff from both Dartmouth and Clemson. And with that, I just want to acknowledge our funding support from NSF and HHS over the years and remind you that you can find more information at these two URLs, one for the Amulet Project and one for the Oracle Project. And with that, Vivek, I'm happy to take questions. Perfect. We'll uh, open it up to the audience. Uh, just make sure you unmute yourself when you ask questions. And Brian, could you also allow that unmuting, please? David, let me lead off that uh, very exciting work uh, and a lot of effort. Now, how? How would you, what would you say to end users, collaborators would like to, uh, other than using the GitHub, uh, engage your team? How, how do they approach what, what is the system? Well, I'd be happy to talk to anyone who is interested in working with the Amulet uh, or uh, talking about the Oracle. We have recently fabricated um, 150 Amulet devices, actually, and are still in the process of testing them to ver verify that they all work. But um, our own work on the Amulet, at least at Dartmouth, is winding down. Um, one of our collaborators from Clemson uh, now has a faculty position at Northwestern, and, and I think he's planning to do more with it. Uh, my point is just that um, it may be possible for us to collaborate or to provide advice or maybe even loan some devices to someone who wanted to explore the amulet. Oracle is still, I would say, uh, still very much in, in motion, um, changing every day. I, it's not something we'd be easily shared at this point, but um, happy to talk to anyone who's interested. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm from MD2K. And so you said you encrypt the data when you it reaches to the cloud. 
and anybody who has the key he can access so i'm assuming it's one to one for example if somebody is saying you cannot share my data when i'm eating with researcher one but you can share my data when i'm smoking with researcher two so if the key is same they can access all the data right so how are you handling this well, I think that's a very good question, um, and I think you're referring back to a slide I called Share Health, in which we were designing a system that would enable that kind of differential yeah. sharing. Yeah. Um, that was part of the Amulet project, but it was not at all specific to the Amulet, and so your example would fit very nicely. And the idea there is that um, we're using attribute-based access control, which is a, a, a fancy cryptographic technique that allows you to encrypt information with a attribute-based key, and thus only individuals who have the relevant attributes can decrypt the information. And so the attributes can be things like a role, but it could also be things like um, I'm trying to think of an easy example. The, the type of the data, of course, or the, the dates during which the data was produced, um, things like that. It's very uh, flexible. And part of what we were interested in that uh, people who have worked on attribute-based encryption haven't done, as far as I know, is handling the temporal aspect. To me, one of the interesting things about mHealth data is that it's a data stream. It's not a document, right? It's not a static single item. It's a stream of readings from eating detector or a heart rate monitor or what have you. And so we used hash chains and reverse hash chains to encode the, the location of the data. So in other words, in order to get a piece of data, I have to give you, in order for you to have a particular set of data from me, I have to give you the relevant attribute-based key to get that type of data and I give you the hash keys that allow you to even find the individual pieces of data. And every hour, let's say, I'll start a new hash chain so that um, I can give you one hour and you won't have access to the next hour because you just won't even be able to find the encrypted pieces of data. A little more complicated than that, I'm sorry, it's hard to explain. Oh, no, there's no, a I, paper I, I, about that. So do you have the code somewhere on the GitHub? Like I can have a look at it. For that for code? Uh, yeah, for the privacy team. Uh, no, but I could probably dig it up. That was That's a good question. Uh, the student who did that, of course, as students will do, has graduated, and um, but I believe we have that code in our local Git repo. If okay. you're really interested, send me an email, and I'll see if I can dig sure. that up. Thank you very much. Other questions? David Vivek again. So I'm kind of intrigued by the Oracle. Uh, I, I see some challenges there asking people to wear it. Uh, typically in an ideal world, all that sensing would be passive. And, uh, and, and then you have all the ambient noise from clicking and popping in the jaw, uh, you know, which a large segment of the population has. Uh, how do you tackle that? Uh, what, what is the user burden? Well, that's a great question. Um, the sensor is entirely passive, which is our goal from the beginning. Um, but at the moment, the device, the mechanical aspects of the device, if you will, are very clunky and some say not very comfortable. And so, um, unfortunately, to me as a computer scientist, the interesting bit is how do you take signal and turn it into data, into information, you know, and how, the machine learning and all that stuff. But a big part of this, the challenge in this project is the mechanical engineering to get it into a form that people are willing and able to wear for long periods. Our ultimate vision is that it would be like a hearing aid. It would be out of sight and hopefully therefore unobtrusive and comfortable. Um, but I'm not sure we'll ever have the engineering bandwidth to get it to that point. To your other question about ambient noise, the main reason we use a contact microphone is that it doesn't pick up ambient noise, at least not much. It does pick up any noise from inside the head, and it's anything basically transmitted through the bones and skin into the contact of the microphone. And that includes, as you mentioned, you know, jaw noises. It'll include part of my voice, obviously, um, if I'm coughing or sneezing or smoking 
or breathing, you know, those kinds of sounds will come through as well. And so one of the challenges um, we faced in designing a classifier to detect eating was that was to collect a variety of those other non-eating sounds. So our very first subjects were asked to come in the lab and eat, but they were also asked to cough and to sneeze and to talk and to sit quietly and to breathe and to, you know, I don't think we asked them to smoke, but tons of other kinds of actions that cause noise in your head. And so that's the machine learning challenge there. Fortunately, excluding ambient noise has not been a big problem for us. So the follow-up to it is you you can uh, elegantly solve the quantity part of it, the quality of the eating episode, meaning how many calories are being ingested, what and how do you tackle drinking sugary sodas, for example? Yeah, that's a great. <clears throat> that's the um, the million-dollar question, right? Uh, it's we have maybe able to measure the quantity of time, but not the quantity of food although we're trying, we're working towards that. And we'll, ne I think, never be able to measure quantity of calories or other uh, dietary metrics of the food with any method like this. It's, it's um, hard to imagine how sound alone could help distinguish those things. And so that's another challenge beyond where we are today. And I know if, you've, if you're familiar with the literature, there's people have tried all kinds of different methods, you know, video and, and still cameras, um, throat sounds, um, plate photographs, and none of them are very accurate as far as I'm concerned. It's going to be a while before we find a good solution. Dave, this is Brian. I wanted to share a question that it looks like we've received in the chat uh, from Shahin Sami, who is uh, one of our team members here at MD2K in Memphis. Um, he says he appears to be having some microphone troubles. But um, his question is, would you elaborate on any use cases of share health? I am sure such a system can help with user and participant privacy, perception of privacy, and even human subjects protections issues. Yeah, so the, the student who did this was an athlete, and she was really in, uh, motivated by scenarios that involved athletics. Um, and of course, it's not limited to that, but one scenario that she often noted was, the, I, and I hinted at earlier, was a, an athlete on a team who is asked to track her workouts throughout the week and is being monitored by the coach and her trainer, for example, who are using physiological data collected by wearable devices during her workouts or perhaps throughout the day to help her better optimize uh, her athletic performance and to adjust her training regimen or maybe diet or something like that to, um, to, to improve performance. And so you would want to selectively um, you would, that athlete would want to select the set of sensors or the set of data coming out of those sensors and the relevant time periods to share with the trainer and the coach, but not necessarily throughout all time. So she said, look, the season only lasts from, let's say, April through June, and yet I've been wearing this heart rate monitor for six years, and I don't necessarily want to share all my heart rate data for six years. I'm just going to select this range of time for my trainer. On the other hand, my doctor, who's helping me recover from that skiing accident two years ago, needs to have access to my knee strain sensor and my workout data for the last three years, or sorry, two years since the surgery, right? And so that was the kind of um, slicing of the data, if you will, that I thought was really interesting, both temporal and uh, topical ways of, of subsetting the data and picking it out for different users to receive. That, um, in that paper is, uh, you should be able to find it on the Amulet Project publications page and the keyword to look for would be share health and the key author was Emily Green who now works at Amazon, actually, hopefully securing their Alexa product. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if anyone is aware of um, other research uh, researchers who are interested in monitoring eating, we'd like to learn more about that. I'm certainly aware of eating behavior research, but I th we have found two collaborators here who are working with us on Oracle um, planning for Oracle use in their studies, and I'd love to talk to others. One of them here measures um, eating behavior in children, and in particular, their behavior as, is, as it might be affected by television advertisements. Do they eat more snack food when they see a snack food ad, for example? And she was interested in getting very fine-grained, real-time eating behavior information from the kids while they're watching TV. That's been a real challenge for us because we had to build an oracle that fits on child's heads. And so that's been uh, really interesting. <laughs> and the other project is um, for binge eating disorder. So these are people who have uh, serious challenges in which they sometimes binge. They eat massive quantities of food and obviously tend to then be obese and they can't control their eating. And so there we're looking for a means to detect binging episodes and quickly so that you might then design an intervention that would help them literally tell them, look, it looks like you're binging. Stop. Go do something else. Remember what the therapist told you to do because some of them will eat and eat and eat and eat and not realize that they're eating, actually. So it's really interesting and another challenge. How do you detect not just eating but a binge episode? And how do you define that in an engineering sense? It's also been very interesting. David, uh, this this has been terrific. Uh, having been involved with the MD2K with a parallel journey, I can only imagine the amount of effort and thought that has gone into both of your Oracle as well as the Amulet projects. And I'm so happy that uh, you could come and share that. Uh, hopefully we can get you back at a later time. Uh, I also want to thank the audience who have uh, logged in from around the country. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Uh, I want to thank you all again for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to joining you at the next webinar. Thank you again, David. And thank you, Brian, for organizing this. Thank you both. I really appreciate being here and uh, enjoyed it. Thank you.